Please enjoy this Lifeline Master Series with Crystal Andrus Morissette. Hey, Crystal. Hey, Darren, how are you? Infinite love and gratitude. I'm awesome and I'm very excited to connect with you today. I'm so excited too, this is fun. So welcome to the Lifeline Master Series and this is all about highlighting people that are showing up in the world and my beautiful friend, you are showing up in the world as a thought leader, as a best-selling author, as the founder of the SWAT uh, coaching organization where you with women have created coaching for women to empower themselves and to discover their authenticity. Just Thank you. Such yeah. an inspir inspiration. And so I, I, I'm, I so appreciate you just taking the time to have this dialogue about you know what it means to actually step up, listen to the heart, yep. discover you know what is genuine and real for you, and yep. and live true to that. And live yeah. true to that. I love that, and I love that you've asked me to be part of this conversation because I think for me right now, this is my biggest growth as a human being has been in the last I would say year to two years, discovering. I didn't even know I wasn't fully stepping up and I'm probably not even still fully stepping up, but just really seeing the difference, um, what it feels like in your body and in your business and everything about who you are when you really come to play. So I love this whole series that you're doing because it's about showing up authentically and coming to play. And man, when you do, your life transcends. It does. And, you know, and I love because I love that you do play and you live large and, you know, you're, <laughs> you're exactly that. You're, you know, you're an inspiration and you're fun and you're real and it doesn't have to be this way. And, you know, it's in our Photoshop world today where, you know, the perfectionist vibration is motivating so many people. My question, just to get this rocking and rolling, my friend, is, you know, what would a day in the life of Crystal Andrus Morissette look like? Do you have certain um, ways or rituals or practices that you implement like so that you can show up? What was that? <laughs> I like to sleep in. No. Okay, Darren, I've got to really You're not sleep. a morning person? I am if I'm not a night person, but the trouble is I'm everything. So I, yeah, you know, I'm actually just beginning this new 30 day love my body challenge. I saw so, that. So it's maybe going to be a little different than it's been this last little while. So um, what's the day in a life of Crystal look like? A lot of fun. You know, it really is. And I would say, let's start with my evening because the evening is what takes me into the next morning. All so right. most evenings are I live out in the country uh, there's about 400 people in our little town and we do a lot of bonfires at night and to get out the guitar last night we were singing the doors um, what <laughs> but song? That, that new Beyonce CD I have to tell you Darren that's some serious woman power because <laughs> I was rocking a Beyonce last night so um, yeah like we have a lot of fun. My husband and I have our own little private parties a lot. He plays the drums and the guitar and the piano and I sing. I was really, I was doing some serious Stevie Nicks last night as well with the microphone. So that's how my evenings I look forward to. And my day really has to work around my life and my joy and my fun and my children who are now 19 and 21. And it's all about this, this synergy of my, my joy and my family and what really lights me up. And so mornings, I'm blessed to wake up when I want. That's the truth. When my body's ready to wake, that's when I wake. So if it dings at 5 a.m. and I want to get up with the birds, I do. If my body says, girl, you need to sleep a little longer this morning, <laughs> I do. Um, but I do also make the commitment that I have to get outside every day and walk. I have three dogs, so I walk every day. Um, I've just joined a ladies, a women's basketball league. So I go to the courts every day. I try to shoot some hoops and uh, have a little fun with that. And, um, and work is just meshed into every part of every day. So last night while I'm singing, I still might grab my computer and then 
you know, write something fabulous to someone or connect with my women on Facebook and I might sing them a song or I might write something, you know, I might see a tragedy or a trauma, but I'm still in my joy, even in someone else's tragedy or trauma, I can still bring my light to that experience. So I just sort of play and show up whether I'm grocery shopping or whether I'm writing my next book and that's how I live my life. So it isn't a set set thing. It's, it's literally living in tune with what my body wants, what my body needs. I eat really well. I listen to what my body really is asking for. I'm a vegetarian. I make the best, most decadent meals. We, you know, it's really, candles are always lit. Music is always playing. And that's the basis of how I live. So it's, it's fun. It's beautiful. It's, you know, two words come to me right now. Passion, which is fire, yes. and water, which is flow. Okay, and so I am a fire sign, and I start all the fires at home. Let's not kid ourselves. Whether it's, you know, a real fire outside at night, because, boy, I can get the campfire going with just give me a few leaves. Let me tell you, I'm the yeah. fire sign. My husband, on the other hand, is the water sign, and he's – He's, he's so, he's taught me, you know, I used to say, don't put out my fire, man. <laughs> You're so emotional. <laughs> don't put out my fire. And now I realize this is the perfect yin and yang. Yeah. I am Niagara Falls, you know, but I, yeah, you, it's the fire, it's the flow and you nailed it. That's for me. That's what life is about. It really, Living, it, it, you mean, it really feels that it's like, well, if, if it's 5 a.m. or if it's 1030 in the morning, you listen to your body and you allow yourself to be present yeah. in that way. Yeah, and I wasn't always this way. Like, uh, to be honest, to get myself to where I am, in, in, in fairness, I was pretty regimented and very disciplined and very determined. And that got me to a certain place in my life. So I'm not saying you could just be loosey-goosey every day. And, you know, I've written five books. You have to be able to sit down and be focused to write books or build schools. So it's not like I'm just one big, you know, fairy go round, merry go round. No, I'm fairy, fairy go round. But, but, um, but yeah, you got to know when it's time to get the job done. And the truth is, for me, it comes easily. Getting the job done is just as much fun as meditating. Well, no, meditating isn't as much fun. <laughs> But I do a lot of praying and uh, yeah, it's all just being in that, trusting it, your body knows. And you know, when I was younger, I was, I was worried about aging. I was worried about gaining weight. I was worried about, and now I'm like, oh gosh, the energy I wasted on things that were so unimportant. And now that I have all this energy that I can really focus on what matters, I get stuff done. And, and I, and people will say, you're so busy. How do you have time for this? And I think, I'm not as busy as you think. And yet, geez, every day I'm knocking something out of the ballpark, but it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel hard. Well, it's wild. And we don't know what we don't know until we know it. And then yeah. we have an ability to be in the flow and create a change in, you know, what's driving us to do something versus, you know, our calling. I remember, you know, because I really can appreciate the balance between really living and really celebrating life, relationships, things that we're passionate about. When I was in chiropractic school, my buddy, Dr. Keith Jordan and I, uh, we would study our butts off and we'd study so hard, but we'd study for two hours and then we'd have a push-up contest and then we'd study for two hours and then we'd play backgammon, study for two hours and we'd go bowling, go shoot hoops and do whatever. And it's like having that balance yeah is the key yeah and and the studying though when you're truly studying what you love and what you want is still part of the fun like yeah. to me i'm always reading i probably read one to two books a week on top of what i'm saying like i might be sitting by the bonfire and it's eight nine ten o'clock at night and i have a flashlight and i'm reading a great book wow. you know so it's you know i love to study to me the study, you know, working my brain is just as important as working my body or having fun. So it's, it's making sure that you're reading what you love, you're learning about what you love, you're fascinated by what you love, 
you just keep digging in deeper to what you love and then the doors just keep flying open and then you keep meeting more amazing people and more opportunities keep coming when you just really stay in that focused groove of what really juices you up. Oh, sister, I mean, tell you, that is the art and science of being a master and recognizing that there's a field of energy that connects all of creation and we have an ability to tap into it. And you've definitely found a flow and a mojo and a spark for you to live authentically in that way. You, you know, just to share, because, you know, there's the catch-all, be-end-all of people, what gets them stuck or what sets them free is their relationship with stress. What's your view on what stress is? Holy Darren, I, in an honest moment, even though my, my next book coming out is actually my memoir. I'm pretty young to be writing a memoir, but um, when someone understands or realizes what I've gone through in my life, um, you know, moving out at 15, I went through a lot of sexual abuse, but different men, um, I had cervical cancer at 17. This whole side of my face was smashed in when I was 21 in a very traumatic injury that left me with nerve damage. I didn't have any plastic surgery. I don't have any Botox. I don't have any of that stuff. But um, when you've had real stress, when you've, when you've actually really been thrown to the wolves, um, all this other stuff, for me, business is fun. This is fun. This isn't stress. Stress would be having nothing to get done. Stress would be not having a home to take care of. Stress would be not having children who I have to run around and take care of. And stress would be not having a husband who loves me that we're trying to find our way sometimes. So for me, the things when I hear people talking about stress, I have compassion and understanding. But if they could see the bigger picture of the totality of their life and their lives and who they really are and what they can access that uh, not a lot stresses me out. Really, really, honestly, not a lot can stress me out. You know, we were driving here to do this interview with you because it, I, I'm yeah, in the country it, where there's no high speed internet. I just so, actually share that with people real quick as you go into this, because this is, but you really made this happen. Well, no, this is nothing. Oh my God. That's not stress. The stress was, I live out in the country, so we don't have high-speed internet. I know, can you imagine? But I love it, and it's okay. And if I need to do something like this, a Skype interview, I've got to call a girlfriend, a girlfriend that's closer to the city and say, hey, can I come and steal your internet for a few minutes? So we had this set time to come, and uh, I don't even know why I'm sharing this story, because you think it's stressful. But um, you know, our, our thing was to start at 1 o'clock, my time. And at you know 12.57, we were still stuck in a construction that went on for 20 minutes holding us there and I said okay so <laughs> I might be late um and yet guess what I, I think I called in at 103 yeah. and it was beautiful and there's no stress do I seem like I just was in traffic 15 minutes ago thinking I wasn't going to make this interview I think it's putting things in perspective and the joy and the excitement and the gratitude I have to do this conversation with you just completely outweighs any adrenaline that's racing around trying to get somewhere. I'm just thrilled and grateful for the opportunity that washes away the cortisol. And for love and gratitude to that. You know, and it's cool because I've, I've heard you talk about um, emotional age. And, you know, and because to me, that bam. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right? Right, yeah. You know, as as we look at the concept of stress, do you mind talking about, because a lot of people, you know, people from, you know, that are watching this, that maybe are meeting you for the first time, can you talk about the concept of an emotional age and how that causes people not to be able to see the big picture and get caught up into that moment and then it becomes the stress that holds yeah. them back or limits them from following their purpose and being in their passionate spark? Absolutely, so it was really, I would actually use the word shocking. When I discovered a few years ago that nobody had written, theorized, created a concept on emotional age, a couple of psychologists throw it around. They'll say, oh, you know, she's showing up like a mother to her husband. It's thrown around. But so I actually, part of my SWAT Institute, I have incredible professors. I don't have a PhD, but I have women with PhDs. So I reach out to them and I say, I have this idea to write a book on emotional age. Has anyone done this before? So I hired my psych, one of my professors who's a psychologist. I said, please, 
Am I downloading information that someone else is? Where's, get to the bottom of it. She said, crystals, no one's done it. So emotional age is really the concept that, you know, scientists have theorized that we all have a biological age. So you could be, you know, I'm 45 chronologically. I like to think I'm still 33. I'm gonna be 33 forever. However, <laughs> um, your emotional age is sort of the idea of how are you showing up in the world? You know, we've all met, you could be 20. Probably when I was 20, I was 80. Because I, where I was at emotionally, I carried the weight of the world on my shoulders. And I call that a parent archetype. Um, so I call it my mother energy. And when I'm in my mother energy, I put on weight, I'm very selfless, I carry the weight of the world on my shoulders. I overgive, overdo, over, it's an emotional age that is, as much as it's saintly and people think you're a saint, it begins to exhaust you emotionally and in your own age. Now, on the other hand, um, we've all met that, and I've been it, um, that woman or that guy who's really young for his age. Like he could be 40, but man, when he's having stress, he acts like a crazy rebellious teenager. Or she acts like, a, you know, she could be 60 with six grandchildren and she's in, under conflict and she's running out of the room and slamming the door on her husband and she's still an emotional age that's really immature. I call it daughter energy or it's a child archetype. So, you know, a lot of our great thinkers have said that we have sort of this trinity within us, this triad, um, whether it was Freud with the id, the superego, the ego. I have created my own trinity. And the trinity is that we have a parent archetype within us, we have a child archetype within us, and then we have this really fully empowered adult archetype. This is, this is that healed part of you. That's when you've really healed your parents inside of you, the part of you that thinks you have to overgive, overdo, because that's an identity that you discovered when you were a little boy or a little girl that said, I'm probably safer in this world if I act like a parent. Mm. The other hand, it's healing that little boy inside of you, that little girl inside of you that thinks her needs are never going to be met. She's all alone. She's scared. And when we heal the parent and the child within us, we naturally transcend into the sort of the top of that spectrum, which is a really empowered emotional age. So yes, you could be 70 and you still feel like you're, what was that age when you were on your game? For me, it was like 33, 34. I started stepping into, don't get me wrong. I love being 45. And I love getting wrinkles. I love that I have gray hair right here that I will not cover because I love it because it's part of what makes me this vibrant, beautiful, empowered 45 year old woman. But that's what emotional age is. It's, it's really healing the stories that cause us to show up too young or too old so that we can really be our most vibrant self at any age. Oh man, it is just so right on. And you know, the way that we're designed um, is that when these parts of ourselves get triggered, right. our brain and our body don't know That's the right. difference between memory, reality, or the imagination. You know, so those past and future parts that are creating trajectories of a tug of war, you know, That's and here we are. Right. That's what's happening. This tug of war going on inside of us all right. the time. So it's like when we can heal that, and that's why for me, the last few years when I say showing up authentically, I didn't even know I wasn't because I wasn't, I still had so many wounds to heal. So the wounds would get triggered and then I would think I have to show up prettier. I, I, have, to be, I have to be prettier if people are gonna like me or oh my gosh, I, I'm too pretty, I gotta get chubby and I gotta be more motherly for people to like me or I've gotta be, when you heal that, then you just become, the real you, whatever you're supposed to be at your happiest, most peaceful, most joyous, most loving version of you. And then you can just be that everywhere you go. Mm. You don't have to think about how to show up. You just show up. It's freedom. It's freedom. It's freedom. And I tell you. Freedom! Sorry. <laughs> Bam. <laughs> so, you know, that is an enlightened point of view. That is, that is a self realization right there. That is so authentic and own your power reality. And, and you started to talk about it a little bit, but I would like to just kind of 
step back a couple feet and just go, man, that just does not happen just on its own, even though it potentially could like, you know, getting to a place where you're aware of the push and pull tug of war of the mind, of behavior, of relationship patterns, of yeah. thoughts and beliefs, getting to that place of understanding. Was there um, a moment that you would say in time, a turning point, a defining moment where you, as a result of experiencing something that you said, enough with this. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in an honest moment, as joyful and happy as I am, you know, I, I believe duality is the spectrum of life. And, you know, all of our great religious texts say that God gave us free will because if we were mandated to be happy, mandated to have good thoughts, mandated to heal the tug of war, mandated to, you wouldn't be empowered. It's not your choice then. It's, it's mandated. And so even with all my joy and my happiness, I realized a few years ago that um, I had created a false image of myself and I didn't do it purposefully. And I started to notice all the people who loved me, all the people who had put me on this pedestal that I didn't ask to be put on, but somehow I'd found myself there. When I faltered, boy, I, would, I couldn't believe the responses. It was like, no, you're a star. You're a, you're, a, you're a shining star. What do you mean you're in the dark? What do you mean you're down in the dungeon right now? That's, I'm angry at you. I'm actually angry at you for not being perfect. And it was in that moment that I really had a dark night of the soul. I had a few of them. In a very honest moment, I remember thinking, I don't know if I want to be here anymore. Mm -hmm. I actually thought, is my whole life's purpose to heal other people? Is my whole purpose to be a shining star for everyone? Is my whole purpose to just, am I codependent? Do, is my identity wrapped up in being loved and needed and I'm exhausted. And I remember um, really getting in the car and crying and driving and feeling like I wanted to check into a hotel and get a magnum of wine. <laughs> and I didn't really know if I wanted to wake up. That's really the truth. So it was like my lifetime of wounds were right there in my face and I could either face them and heal them and deal with them and be real or i could stay on that treadmill of just spinning and running and fixing and healing and bigger and bigger and brighter and better or i could say i have dark moments in with all that light um and acknowledging that dark moment was a massive breakthrough for me i got a therapist for the first time in my life um never had had any kind of darren i I have never been to someone else's workshop. When you say, how did you do that on your own? I don't have a, I don't even have a degree. I love God. I feel God speaks to me. I've never been to somebody's workshop. I've never taken somebody else's course or class. You did an amazing lifeline healing session with me. Um, between your two sessions with that with me, I had one call with Colette Baron reed and three therapy sessions. The lights turned on and took me to a new level. And I know now how important it is to also get help. You can't just be a healer and a helper. And it, that awakening for me to realize, Crystal, you need to be healed. Yeah, you have some kind of magic juju in you that God gave me or my DNA or something gave me a high IQ and ability to tap into something divine. But I needed to talk about my life now. I need to talk about my wounds now. I needed to, to tell you stuff, you know, and you didn't even, that session that we did together, you said, I don't even need to know your history. We just, we have a process now that can shift you even higher. And so between that and honestly, three therapy sessions, and if I need more, I'll go back. But three therapy sessions was enough to feel validated, to actually have somebody say to me, your life matters too. Your life matters too. Not just you healing everybody else, but your life matters. Hmm. And so that was a, I matter. And that might seem crazy to say that, but it wasn't just the books I could write. It was that my own life matters. My own joy matters. M my happiness matters. Singing at night matters. 
having a bonfire matters. I can't just be a working machine because I matter. And I haven't had dark nights of the soul for a while, but I'm sure they'll come back. And when they do, I know to get help now. I know I can reach out and it doesn't make me wounded or broken. And it does. And maybe I am wounded and broken, but oh, well, who cares? I got a little wounds and a little brokenness. And it's not an exciting journey to know now I can talk about them and I can heal them. Yeah, Gord, you know, it's so gorgeous. I mean, we're made to break. Hearts are made to break. Minds are made to break. Relationships are made to break because there's something that is in a constant evolutionary state of emerging and evolving it is and what i am so inspired by is that you know as leaving your home as a teenager and you know i read that you were homeless that you were raped multiple times that your face was smashed in that you've gone through these experiences and you know and, and i hadn't healed them i hadn't healed them what i had done darren is I had this amazing capacity to take pain and almost use it as a ladder, like a stepping stool. I literally could take pain and suffering in my life and not get pulled into the story. I would just look at it like, okay, I gotta have to climb up on top of that one. Okay, I got, but then eventually once I hit my forties, all that pain was still in there buried and it had gotten me to this very, cause if you can channel anger, it's jet fuel. Oh yeah. I, I didn't walk around like an angry person. I walked around like the happiest person in the world. Right. But the stories and the shame, it was the shame of those stories. What if someone discovers that about me? What if someone finds out that? What if someone finds out that, yes, I had a scholarship to university, but I had a choice to make. Do I move my 12-year-old sister in with me and the two of us get a little apartment, a little room? Do I move my little sister in with me? I was 18 and she was 12 to get her out of that chaos. Or do I go get an education? So the shame that I carried my whole life being like, I was in an enrichment program my whole life. I have a genius level IQ and I don't have an education. That's shameful. So I had to overcompensate. So I spent 40 years overcompensating, proving that I was masterful. And then it wasn't until I realized, yeah, yeah, girl, you done it. You did it. You got it. And now what about your little heart? What about your little soul? What about you and healing that? And so that's what brought me to you because I don't even think I would have had the courage to tell someone I was scared or I was hurting or something in my body hurt because I'm supposed to be in alignment. To have aches and pains means I'm not in alignment with my real self. So I can't tell anybody that. I just gotta try to heal it on my own. You know, and it was like finally realizing we can't do this alone. We're, we're, we're pack animals. We need each other. It is and true. We need desperately to share our stories and to be validated and to say, even in spite of your craziness, you're still fabulous. Yeah. And what I love about your fabulousness, well, everything, but yeah. what I, I love is that you've taken the pain and you know, being in this place of, of stress and the pressures of your life and you're helping other people, thousands upon thousands, of, you're empowering women. Yeah. Um, you know, my vision when I woke up with a lifeline is in my mind, I'm like women and children. Yeah. But literally that was my mind. I'm like women. And, so the SWAT um, Institute. Institute that you founded that ultimately comes from you being in this burning place and you rising from those ashes and you know and being authentic and genuine and 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 humble and rather than saying i've got all my shit together and i'm always this way that's saying no i got dark nights and and they and you empower thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of women around the world with real tools to go through their own dark nights and that you're not alone. We got you. You have to find a safe place. We all do. We have to find a safe place. And what I learned is just telling your story to your husband who, who loves you and wants the best for you doesn't heal you. Just telling your story to, it, there has to really be a safe place and then a process to lift you out of that. 
Because how many of us have written the same stories over and over in our journal? We're still writing it. It's not healed. We're still telling those same damn stories. And so for me, the SWAT Institute was, we need to form a safe place. It's not anti-man, but it's a safe place because let's not forget a hundred years ago, there wasn't a woman in the world that was considered a person yet by law, a person by law. And so women couldn't vote, couldn't, didn't have rights over their own bodies. They were chattel. We were literally possessions that were passed from our husband to our husband, uh, from our father to our husband. In fact, you know, the home I live in, I think it's pretty interesting. I do retreats out of my home. I live in a 180 year old house out in the country. And I have this beautiful retreat center there that the woman, the woman who built that house 180 years ago, she came from a lot of money and she was, you know, um, her father passed and she had to find a man. She had to marry. So she married this man named John Ionson, um, and God bless him. You know, our streets named after him, our parks named after him, everything's named after him, nothing's named after her. But anyways, uh, apparently he didn't turn out to be a really loving husband. And so she was the first woman in Canada to go to the attorney general to ask that her husband be removed from the house. Wow. So this was huge. And she had four boys and a daughter. And she, she left the house to her daughter. And it stayed in that family line until I bought it, the house. Um, so it was amazing. And so the energy there is magnificent. It's where I've written all my books. It's the work that I do. And so when I teach that to women that this is not anti-man, this is you were groomed to be disempowered. We've been groomed for thousands of years. I was groomed to be a sexual object. It's nobody's fault. It's how I was groomed. I was pretty. I was sexually abused. My mother was sexually abused. My mother was actually brutally raped and abducted when she was 14 years old taken out of the city by two older men who had children her, her same age, they found out. And she was left basically as trash way outside the city. And she walked to a house. She was taken to the hospital. The police came. All of that happened. Um, when she got in the car that night, her father told her, you're never to tell anybody this happened to you. Oh and she God. never told anybody, never got help. Interestingly, you, you are a genius and you know about epigenetic programming. I was raped at 14. My daughter nearly died at 14. I knew I had to heal the legacy of the women who came before me. The work that I do in the world is helping women to heal their legacy so that we can have healthy children, so we can have healthy marriages, so we can, we can be the CEOs of companies and we don't have to be sexual objects, but we can still embrace our sensuality and own what makes us such beautiful women. We, we need this. We need men. And men need us. And um, it's really coming together now in a way where we're equal partners and we can love each other and we can bring the yin and the yang of what makes me me and you you. I don't want to be a man. I know my husband has no desire to be a woman. <laughs> you know, he says, I said, he said, don't you wish you could have been more a man though in this world? Don't you wish you were born a man? I said, no, nothing in me wants to be a man. I love being a woman. <laughs> I need women to know how to show up mm -hmm. in a way we've never been taught in the history of the world. In the history of the world, we've never had empowered female role models that have run companies, that have owned their own TV shows. Oprah Winfrey was the first woman in the world to own her own television show in 1986. 1986. 1986, this is the first woman, a black woman, bam. I mean, this is what we need, yeah. you know? So I'm just following in the footsteps. I say Oprah raised me yeah. because I was 15. I moved out on my own. I had a little black and white TV with rabbit ears. I watched Oprah Winfrey every single day of my life. I saw the very first show. I was just a teenager. And I feel like she taught me how to be a woman. And now I need to take that along with all my learning along with all the incredible people I've met over the last 30 years. And now we've created this program that gives women the tools. Yeah. And you know, the program you've created, uh, what I love about it is, you know, when you first came to me, I said, gosh, is this a conflict? Cause that's that fearful mentality, right? The fearful mentality is there's not enough to go around. And then you did the process on me and I said, oh, this is just a perfect, this is just a perfect, added component to what I'm already teaching. This gives women another intervention, another process 
to shift ourselves and to shift our loved ones into a higher level of consciousness. Mm -hmm. So to me, I mean, boy, it's incredible the work we're all doing and that we're all so synergistically doing it together. It is incredible. It, it is. is. It is. It, 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 there's like so many things going through my mind. Um, and I want, I'm going to pause there and come back in a second and then go back to that. Who are women? Who are they? It's like the, just the concept of on our planet, based upon the history of women that still live in our DNA that is perpetuating itself in a reactive way, uh, culturally, um, keeping a trance on both men and women. It's like, does the planet Earth, Mother Earth, actually even know what a woman really is? Is there actually a woman on this planet or a man that can own his divine feminine that that no, often is here? And I don't, I don't think it's here. No, I don't think I it's here yet. I think, we're, I think what you, exactly what you're doing, like you saying like, I love it. Like, Oprah in 86 is when I graduated high school. It's like Oprah, you know, it has been this leading, you know, vibration for so many people, you know, just building upon the shoulders of competent women. But it's like, I don't believe that our planet actually knows what it means to be. A well, woman. I love that you say that because in my introduction of my latest book, The Emotional Edge, I talk about that. So much has already been written about the mother. We know what a mother is. We know what a daughter is. You know, when you think about Carl Jung, he has the father, the wise old man, the hero, but he only has the archetype. What's the archetype for women? He has the dangerous old or the wise old woman. That's it. We have uh, Dr. Clarissa Piccola Estes. She writes about all these female archetypes. We have the dangerous old woman. What does it mean to be a woman? What does it mean to be a woman? Is she spiritual? Is she sexy? Is she smart? Is she silly? Does she need a man? Does she need no one? Does she need sex? Does she, if she has children, should she become self-abnegating? Should she be, what does it mean to be an empowered woman in this world? Can she have it all? Can she have it all? Does she have to continue to search fruitlessly for possibilities and role models? We now have to set a new, I want the word woman to be a clearly defined archetype. I mean, even, I gotta tell you something, even, excuse my French, the bullshit name of man, woman, no. even that. It's I know. Listen, Darren, you know, I say to people, you know, I still have men that go, women are, it's all equal now. I go, listen, buddy, <laughs> listen, listen. When I'm born, I'm a little miss. If I should be lucky enough to get married, I have to start checking the box on everything that says, I'm a missus. And then God forbid I'm shamefully divorced. I'm now a miss. You're born a mister, you die a mister. Your identity has nothing to do with the woman in your life. My identity is still connected to if a man loves me, if a man wants me. Yeah. And so why we women, we honest to God, we are still like little girls that are so want your love. We, that will never change. A woman still, the way a child looks to his mommy, a woman will still look to her man and say, do you love me? Am, are you a are you, Am I beautiful? And I don't want that to end. I want a man to be my knight in shining armor. I want to be his queen. I want that for women. But women don't know what that means. And so they're either demanding, they're showing up and we're now being encouraged to assert ourselves and be demanding and demand your raises and demand your, and I go, well, you're probably going to get fired if you do that because it's a man's world. <laughs> Let's not get ourselves. So we have to find a way that we can communicate in a way where a man says, I hear you. I see you. I really see you. And how can a man do that if a man doesn't even know who he is in this world that is all part of whatever we, beliefs? We shut down. We shut yeah. down half of Amazing. the population. We've shut down. No, I, I, I don't agree with that. I think we shut down 100% of the population. I think right. men are driven in a patriarchal way to just gong, 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 gong. And then that's a part of everything as well. I think mean, men are equally entranced in power. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, yeah. yeah it's the Dalai Lama came to Canada in 2009 at the Vancouver Peace Summit. And he said very boldly to this Canadian audience, uh, the Western woman will heal the world. Right. And right. it created a ruckus. And it wasn't that we're more intelligent or we're more, not at all, but I can speak my truth. And I'm only 
freaking starting to figure out what that even means. And, but the rest of the world is counting on women like me to say what it means to be me. And, and what does it mean to love? And what does it mean to think? And what does it mean to have breasts and ovaries? What does it mean to be able to create a life inside of you? What does it mean to be able to, what we can do, the magic that we have in us that has been so oppressed is, um, I say I'm Niagara Falls. You know, my therapist asked me, because I only had those three sessions, but he said to me on the first or second session, I literally, God bless him, this brilliant old Jewish man. He even, in his brilliance, on the first call, talked to me like, I actually had to say to him, who do you think you're talking to? Why are you talking to me like that? He said, he caught himself. This is a guy who, who is so brilliant and he teaches equality. I mean, he's a, he was first a lawyer and then he became a therapist and he's brilliant. But he still talked to me like I was a little woman. He didn't even catch it. And I had to say to him, David, do you know who I am? Why are you talking to me like that? And he said, who are you? I... I said, who am I? He said, okay, you think you're so strong. How strong are you? Tell me and use your fists right now. Tell me how strong you are. Could you pick up a building? I laughed at him. <laughs> Gotta pick up a building. I am Niagara Falls. <laughs> I am Niagara Falls. And when you get that, the force that women have, the power that we possess, we've come from the tributary. We come right down. We pour through everything. We meld into it all. We, when we are allowed to just be in our greatness, we heal and move and we shift and we, we, we can move into the smallest little places and we can, we can give life. And don't talk to me like I'm a stupid, blonde, buxom woman. I have so much more to offer than that, please. He, he woke up in that call. He started talking to me like, bam. And then we started having really important conversations that mattered. And by the third one, I said, thank you. I got what I need. You're a effing brilliant man who finally effing showed me respect. So now I know I can get on with my life because you, who are so effing brilliant, you, you see me? I can see me. I see me now. Thank you. You did what I needed. That's so cool, man. I, I tell you, that is, it's also, it, it's uh, bridges back to the beginning of our conversation where you're like, God gave us free will and that concept of what the heck does that mean? at least from a perspective of we don't get to choose what happens. Our choice and free will is how we respond. And for you to really wake up in this way and to be such a inspiration, such a powerful, seriously, bam, in the love and gratitude, high five. For you to be courageous, and, and you are courageous to show up and face the fear and face the story face the archetype that is not defined in any way whatsoever and begin to allow it to unfold and emerge. I, I have a question because we did, we, you're like, all right, let me experience what this lifeline thing is. Cause we did one session before where it, but that was in a moment of, um, yeah. you had a, a shot in an arm and there was, but we, how would you say, Knowing what you know, being who you are, teaching what you teach, showing up the way you show up. How did the Lifeline session that we shared um, impact you? Uh, it supercharged me. That's what it did. It supercharged me. And it reminded me of who I really am. It, it helped me just really reconnect to this, this purest essence of who I am. I am peace. Feeling vibrant. Yes, in you are. Gratitude. Mm. I am peace. And... Darren, I must have said it a thousand times over the course of the next few days. Like everywhere I walked, I would just go, I'm peace. And then it just got to be almost like, hello, I am, <laughs> I am vibrant. Like, why would I be anything other than that? Right. Why would I be anything other than the truth of who I am? So everything else became false, weak, lies. Life. Everything else started to fall away from me. When I'd start to feel myself being pulled into a drama or pulled into something, I would just say, but why would I respond that way? Because I am peace, feeling vibrant. I know who I am. I, I, I 
feel and am infinite love. And the gratitude I felt for that experience was, it was very, it was, it was shifting. It was shifting. It shifted me in something. I can't put a finger on exactly what it was. I didn't walk out of there and go, my back, I'm not going to lie. I didn't walk out and go, well, in the moment I said, my back feels better. Everything feels better. Oh my God, I feel better. Everything feels better. But did it last? What lasted was the knowingness. That's what lasted for me. The reminder. I knew that. We all know who we are deep at the core, but sometimes we just need someone to help remind us, ah, that's familiar. I'm being me again. Ah, so that I can just catch myself. And it's truly what gave me the kick in the butt to say, you know what? I've put on 20 pounds. Were those 20 pounds put on with a lot of fun? They am right, they were. There was a lot of drinking and a lot of eating and a lot of bonfires and a lot of red wine and a lot of cheese and a lot of relaxation and a lot of, geez, that was fun. But there was also this kick that said, and I think what you helped me is, isn't it a travesty that I still think on some level I have to play it a little smaller for people to like me? Mm. and that, sh that conversation that we had and that process you took me through, I just got off and went, but if I'm vibrant, I can't drink that much wine because I'm not vibrant the next morning. I don't feel as vibrant. So it wasn't about, I'm not, I'm not gonna drink any more wine. It wasn't, I'm not gonna, it was the realization that there's the joy of it and then there's the overindulgence. And if I am peace, feeling vibrant, I don't need to overindulge in things that are hurting me. Because I am peace. I don't hurt myself. You know, it's wild. It wasn't you that was overindulging or you playing small. It was a part of you. Right. Right. A hundred percent. It was a little wounded part of me that thought, I can't, I can't cope with this big life. So when I have a couple glasses of wine, I'm, I'm more relaxed in this big life. Not realizing, no, who you are created this big life. Why would you not be able to cope with the life you created? Of course you can. You're vibrant. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. I have wine again? Yes. But um, there was just a really, really neat internal shift. That's all I can say, that it was just this really, really profound. And it, and it just keeps developing over time. It's, it's, it's getting bigger. Yeah, and I'm sure as you um, teach the women that you empower, that life is not a perfect, that life's a practice. Yeah. And, and in much different than, right, and, and much different than like the therapy session where you got three, you would do three sessions and I'm done with it. When I teach Lifeline, I teach people to create a practice because life is ever evolving and it's not like we get somewhere and we live happily ever after. You know, that we learn certain tools and strategies that empower us to be our fullest and greatest potential depending upon any given moment. And that might be in a moment where I'm in a tragedy and I'm really hurt and I'm having a dark night. Or it might be a moment where I'm with best friends and I'm rocking out to Christina Aguilera and, I, and here it is and the power of it. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it's a wonderful, I think what I would say to anyone that's wondering or considering it is it's another amazing, um, really profound emotional tool that you can put in your own internal toolkit. And then once you have that, you're not you know, trying to fix something that needs a screwdriver with a hammer. Now you actually go, oh, there's actually a process I could do to lift me into a higher place. Yeah. It's not deep therapy. Not that therapy isn't wonderful. I think all of those things. I think we need all of our different healers and sages and authors and speakers and uh, medicine women and doctors and we need it all. And we all find what resonates with us. But for me, the process that you did, it really resonated. It just really, there was a connection and I, I loved it. So That's thank cool. you. You're thank welcome. You. Thank you for yeah. doing it with me. Like you, I think you gave me the grand the whole enchilada whatever it was you gave me the 
<laughs> I did give you. Oh, yeah, you gave me the full Monty. It was great. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And my, you know, my brother's a psychologist. He specializes in trauma, and but he also is certified in the lifeline technique because it helps to bridge the gap between the conscious and subconscious mind. But it is not therapy. It isn't. Why? Why, as a teacher to coaches, were you? You know, you teach to coaches you know, a process to empower themselves, but to also empower other people. Why would you recommend Lifeline as a coach? Well, because our process at our school, we're not life coaches. Life coaches are a to-do list. This is, what do you want to accomplish? And I got no problem with that. Some of us need a kick in the butt and they need someone to say, okay, so you need to do this many sit-ups today and you need to do that many things by Friday. And then you're going to check in with me and tell me that you got your homework done. That's great. That's important. What we do is that we shift people. We actually use a lot of, a lot of the, the people that you have for this program, this master um, series, series um, are all part of the faculty. They're guest faculty at, our SWAT, at the SWAT Institute. And so what we do is we really focus on how do we shift you in the way you're showing up emotionally because your perspective is always going to be based on your lenses. And so your perspective on life is based on your lenses. So we try to, to open up the perspective to a higher perspective to help people see there's so many more choices than you realized. And there's a way that you can communicate your needs at a higher level. So what you do is in perfect alignment with sort of Dr. David Hawkins' map of consciousness. It, it's in perfect alignment with, it just, it continues the process of what we're already teaching women and it gives them one more tool. Um, to it, it just it beautifully mends melds with the work that we're doing so not just for those women that are doing my program but i think for anyone for any coach therapist uh nutritionist dietitian i mean there are so many ways that when we start to work with somebody that we can go wait something isn't clicking here and maybe we could do the lifeline process just to open things up to to, to lift you to a higher level of consciousness so that we can do deeper work in the stuff we're doing. Yeah. Well, yeah, so it all works beautifully together. It's yeah, very so simple. You're amazing. And you're lifting me, baby. <laughs> higher and higher. I tell you, I so appreciate this is this has been so much fun and so inspiring. Thank you, Darren. There's been moments in this conversation I felt like my heart was just gonna jump out of my chest. Just just there's uh, there's a ton more I'd love to talk to you about. I mean it's really it's this has been so much fun, and I know that there are so many golden nuggets in here that people are really going to walk away with and really have a deeper appreciation and value of who you are as an amazing um, leader in, this, in the world, as a human being, you know, and uh, I just so appreciate you taking the time and showing up and being who you are, and yeah, God bless you. Infinite love and gratitude, Crystal. Infinite love and gratitude, and I got to tell you just before we say goodbye, I've never done this type of thing. And I got to tell you, you say your heart was, I could feel like, I don't even know if my eyes are looking into your eyes right now, but when you're talking, they're looking so deep into my soul as through the screen that I feel like I'm right in the same space as you. Yes. So that's amazing that you can touch me in that way through a computer screen. You're so attentive. You're so plugged in. Um, it, you're so validating. It's, that's a huge gift to give to people. You really see me. And I thank you for that. And I, and I do. And, I, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm so honored. I'm so honored. The world needs superheroes and sheroes. It, this is, there's so much intensity. There's so much fear. The terrorism isn't just, oh, when's this going to happen? It goes on in our mind from the moment people wake up to the moment that they go to bed. And these patterns go on and on. And people, when they don't understand their subconscious minds, when they don't understand their emotions, then the edge is a cliff that it's going to be you know, devastation rather than I'm going to fly. That's yeah. It. yeah. Like your, like your beautiful wings. So thank you. I, I, I love you. I adore you. And I'm, I'm excited for uh, people to uh, gain so much from, uh, from our dialogue that we shared today. Thanks Darren. It's wonderful. Yeah. Infinite love and gratitude. Love you back. <laughs> yes. So awesome. I hope you enjoyed this lifeline master series as much as I have. Wow, we went deep into some incredible, incredible topics. If you want to learn more about the Lifeline Technique, be sure to click on the link below. 
You'll be able to learn about muscle reflex testing, how we communicate with the subconscious mind. It's amazing through reflexes in our body. The triune brain theory, a deep understanding how our behavior, how our biology is related to our emotions on a subconscious level and how to create a shift. And the third video, which is so cool, is about the secret sauce of infinite love and gratitude. What could be better? Enjoy, click on the link below, and I'll see you on the other side. Infinite love and gratitude.